All right, music fans, welcome back. Harmless me here talking about real music and real pretentious writing uh, and doing it in real time for a couple of real people out there just like you and just like me. All right. So I'm going to cover this John Mellencamp article. These are just so good, right? You could tell when like the media and cultural industrial complex, you can tell when they're just gushing and they just in love with somebody because of their political views and what they represent, right? Which is far more important than the music that they're creating, really, all right? And I'll get to this super pretentious article. Um, before I get there, here is a guy who's not pretentious at all. Eric Lovery, Twilight Dream. I highlighted this album last year. Um, if you like Tom Petty's second album, it's called You're Gonna Get It. And then you combine that sound with vintage uh, birds music um, from, I don't know what part of their career, probably the middle. Uh, you get something sort of like Eric Lovery. This is really good. Um, this got played a lot on a radio station called Modern Retro Radio, which I was uh, promoting a lot last year. Uh, and it's just good. And Eric's good. And my buddy Dean Castronovo plays drums on this. So, again, no one else is going to promote it, right? So they're leaving it up to me. All right. So good for Eric and, and good for the world for giving me this responsibility, you know. Only took how many years to get this responsibility? But here I am, folks. Here I am. I'm not going away. All right. So <laughs> there's this article in a newspaper in or near uh, Birmingham, Alabama. It's called the Aniston Star. And they've been uh, in business since 1883. And Larry May, who is special to the star, has written an article entitled John Mellencamp is a real national treasure. And then the second line says, Jack and Diane artist is performing in Birmingham on Friday. <laughs> so they, I love when they reduce everybody to one song, Jack and Diane artist. That's it. Just Jack and Diane. That's his only hit song. Okay. And they do that. This is getting for me and, and maybe it doesn't matter. Right. But for me, it's just, this is so condescending for people who lived through that era and who know that you can't reduce somebody, even Mellencamp, you shouldn't reduce him to one song. So Larry starts writing and <laughs> and he's he right away. He's going to prove to us that he's a great writer. OK, so here's the first sentence. John Mellencamp is bringing his live and in-person tour to the BJCC Concert Hall on Friday, April the 12th. Okay. And then he goes, that sentence seems pretty innocuous upon first sight. <laughs> well, it is pretty innocuous. Uh, on second sight, it's pretty innocuous. When I'm looking at it again, it's still really innocuous. There are, however, many... Now, this sentence is just... This is great. This is so... I'm this great writer, and I'm going to enlighten you on all things Mellencamp. There are, however, many crashing waves to be navigated until one hits the salty seabed of all matters Mellencamp. The salty seabed? <laughs> Is that like low tide when the water goes out and it's the, the salty seabed? See, all the crashing waves created a salty seabed. And those are all things Mellencamp. You with me so far? It's it's not going to get much better. Uh, he's a national treasure as important as Springsteen when viewed through a songwriting prism. No, no, he's not. Springsteen is, a, I don't even like Springsteen, and I know Springsteen is a better songwriter than Mellencamp. Um, John hit a nice, sweet spot. Rain on the Scarecrow, that era in the middle of the 80s. He kind of got his serious mojo on for two or three albums. And then that was kind of it. As much as I don't like Springsteen, Springsteen had the songwriting mojo right out of the block. Whereas little Johnny Cougar, 
uh, was writing what he called smarmy cocktail music. That's what he called it. I mean, I didn't think it was that bad, but, you know, until he kind of hit his stride in the mid 80s, um, you know, he was just uh, another guy trying to make it big in the rock music industry. Um, but he's a national treasure as important as Springsteen when viewed through a songwriting prism. Where are my songwriting prisms? I must have left them in the other room. Do you have a song? I need a songwriting prism. Um, a grizzled vet of the savage corners of the music business. He's grizzled. I'm grizzled. He's grizzled. Where I'm a grizzled vet. I don't know. Um, anyway. He goes, and in my opinion, a mirror we could all aspire to be where race relations are concerned. Uh, what? 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 Okay, the needle was on the record. We were kind of going along fine, and then whoosh, went right off. And now we're talking about race relations. How did that all happen? Um, okay, so right there, you know that the writer, <laughs> his his forte is not whether this music is any good, whether Mellencamp is a good songwriter. His forte is, does Mellencamp line up with the establishment? Which, you know, Springsteen does. That's why he's a national treasure. Mellencamp obviously does. Because, um, again, I, I like to bring this up because people forget. Who did John Mellencamp support for president in 2020? Anybody? Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. Um, it was Michael Bloomberg. Now, I'm sure he went over to Biden after Bloomberg's campaign imploded. Uh, Bloomberg basically tried to spend his way into the presidential race. Michael Bloomberg, the man who is for the working class, he understands what the working class go through. And so Mellencamp, Mellencamp did ads for Michael Bloomberg for president. All right. Is is Michael Bloomberg really great on race relations? I just I don't know. And by the way, Bloomberg at one point was a Republican. He was the guy who replaced Rudy Giuliani in New York as mayor. And then he became an independent when it became less fashionable to be like Giuliani. And then I don't know. Did he do a? Yeah, he converted completely, I think, to being a Democrat and all the Democrats we're like, hey, you're not really a Democrat. You're you're interloping. Get out of our party, right? And he's like, no, I've got money. <laughs> and so that's who Mellencamp supported for president. John Mellencamp, the man who writes great songs about the working class. He totally understands them. All right. Um, so we learn that he's a grizzled vet of the savage corners of the music business. And in my opinion, a mirror we could all aspire to where race relations are concerned. What, how did we get to, I don't even know how we got there. We're talking about songwriting. We're talking about the music business. We're talking about a mirror. And then we're talking about race relations. Okay. Uh, and then he goes on to say, <laughs> he, he also has pretty good rhythm when he decides to give his penny loafers a workout. Oh my gosh. I just picture this guy, and, and I'm not talking about gray hair, because, you know, I, I mean, I, I get it. It just happens. But this guy's hair is probably white, right? And he's in some office cubicle somewhere. And he's, he's well, I was going to say typing, but you don't have to do that anymore. You can, you can speak these articles into existence now. You can just use a processing tool that allows you to do what I'm doing, just talking, and you can create your article. He's talking about penny loafers. He's talking about Mellencamp's penny loafers and how apparently um, when John gives those loafers a good workout, he's got some good rhythm. Um, I first began paying attention when his album American Fool was issued in 1982. <laughs> Who talks like this? I remember when Foreigner 4 was issued back in 1981. You know what you would normally say if you're a regular listener to rock and roll music? You would say, yeah, remember when that album came out? That was cool. 
No, he's talking to a very sophisticated audience. Remember when American Fool was issued back in 1982? I do. And it was one of those watershed moments in the history of music. Who was audacious enough to go by the surname Cougar and also author a song as catchy as Jack and Tom? Okay, what do those two things have to do with one another? It was John Cougar. He's, he's looking for a rock star name. So he picked Cougar. There's a story behind it. I forget the story, but he picked Cougar. I don't know. His agent probably said, hey, what about Johnny Cougar? And he said, yeah, all right. Because Mellencamp, your name is Mellencamp? Oh, we're changing that. We're, we're definitely changing that. But... Uh, who was audacious enough to go by this surname Cougar and author a song as catchy as Jack and Diane? Um, a lot of people have fake rock star names and they author catchy songs. That's my that's going to that's where I'm going with this. Much attention was paid when he followed that little ditty <laughs> with pink houses the next year. Really? So he didn't release any other songs after. See, <clears throat> do, 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 do. All right. Stuff is going in my brain about how people only remember the two songs that are always on the radio. Uh, now, not back then. Um, anyway, so we went from just, he was just Jack and Diane. There weren't any other songs. And then Pink Houses comes out next year. All right. My environment in 1985 was basically my radio, my stereo, and the television in the living room that doubled as a launch pad when I turned the channel to MTV. A launch pad? Really? So you could launch out of your living room to another place because MTV had that cool, what, that astronaut thing that they did? And they played, dun, 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 dun. and you thought to yourself, we're launching. I have a launch pad. <laughs> I have a launch pad in my living room. Music television. Who, who calls it music television? He called it MTV once, but okay, you have to call it music television now because you've already used MTV. Uh, so it was where I could travel with Duran Duran to a faraway paradise, catch a ride to Cali with hair bands, and imagine a place as mystical as Minneapolis with Prince. Um... Did anybody think about where they were going when they were listening to Prince? I didn't. I was watching Prince kind of slither on the floor and think to myself, that's kind of weird. I don't know if I like Prince. Anyway, um, and yeah, most of the hair bands were from California, but I don't think anybody really cared all that much where they were from. Just putting it out there. Twisted Sister, weren't they from like Long Island? Mellencamp was always included on the manifest. <laughs> what are we? What is this, an airplane? Oh, that's right. I forgot. He launched. It was a launch pad. So maybe it's an airplane. So Mellencamp was always on the manifest. So if the plane goes down, we know who was on the manifest. This is the kind of pretentious, ridiculous writing that gets in the way of getting to anything that's truly important about this concert. And He's he's appearing. He's going to be at this place near Birmingham, Alabama. Of course, we have to mention race relations because we're in Birmingham. Mellencamp was always included on the manifest. Good. So we know he's on the plane if the plane goes down. I had no idea that inclusion would change my life and the way I viewed it. Oh, my gosh. Um, folks, a little... A little spoiler alert here, all right? As you can see, I like music, right? I got some CDs hanging around here. I got albums. I got books. I got this set up here. I love music, right? Um, very few people who have entered my life via music, like listening to them, have, have truly changed my life. I would have to say there are some spiritual songs that I listen to with words in those songs and sometimes the melodies as well that move me maybe in a certain direction right and make me think about important matters 
Um, John Mellencamp, Bruce Springsteen, Bob Dylan, God bless them all. But yeah, no, they didn't change my life. They didn't. This guy, though, he had no idea that Mellencamp being on the manifest <laughs> would change his life. And the way he viewed his life, his album Scarecrow was the first album that made me more conscious of the world that I lived in. Ah, okay. So <clears throat> Mellencamp started writing about like the working class and farmers and, and those were really good songs. Scarecrow was kind of like where things were, I would say, the best for Mellencamp. That's when he got his songwriting mojo. And supposedly this guy wasn't aware of anything until he heard Scarecrow. There was nothing prior to Scarecrow that focused on those issues, right? So I, I can see this maybe, this is kind of plausible, but I think this might be a revisionist view of this guy's life in order to write a, I, don't, I was going to say decent article, but just write an article that fit uh, what this newspaper is all about or what he's all about. I don't know. So when Cougar added his proper last name and became John Cougar Mellencamp, he also painted a landscape where farmers struggled to feed both our country and, more importantly, the folks around their supper table. Aren't those the same people to feed both our country and, more importantly, the folks around their supper table? Mm, I, I don't get that sentence. So a farmer's struggled to feed both our country and more importantly, the folks around their supper table. So our country, I guess, has a very large supper table and the folks around it need to be fed. And he found out that people in some places don't have enough food because of John Mellencamp. These songs also fomented the creation of farm aid to combat the hardship that was woven into their lives these families faced while serving their fellow man. Okay, now a little full stop observation. Now I lived through the 1980s. All right, so he hasn't he hasn't mentioned Ronald Reagan yet, hasn't mentioned him yet, but I'm I'm waiting. All right, now you compare the level of poverty, and I would say outright misery in the world right now for many people compared to. 1985, Reagan had just won a 49th state landslide. People were really happy for the most part. Now, you can find fault in everything, right? But again, I was still a fairly young man in 1985. And I can tell you, I had money. And most of the people I know had money. Now, were farmers getting screwed? Sure, probably. They're, they're getting screwed now. <laughs> What's he saying? Is That was the time where I focused on how bad things were, even though they were infinitely better than they are now. But he's, he's not going to say that because he has an agenda here. He's writing something. He's fitting. He's trying to fit this into a narrative. And, and it's just, it's hokey. It's goofy. If you live through it, See, these people will never admit that the 80s were great. They'll never admit it. They were fantastic. Anyway, he goes on. I considered myself enlightened because of John Mellencamp and Farm Aid and had found a John or not a John, not a bathroom. He had found in John a North Star, a North Star for social issues. Ah, that I felt compelled to find out more about. So he didn't know anything about social issues until John Mellencamp appeared on MTV and interrupted those hair bands from California. His 1987 release, The Lonesome Jubilee, offered perspective on family strife with the first single, Paper and Fire, a song, by the way, that you don't hear on the radio. Uh, the second single, Cherry Bomb, was a pay-in to his teenage years and also a splendid setup for a third single, Check It Out. <laughs> yes, I know. The record label couldn't figure this out on their own. 
Cherry Bomb is really the big song from that record because it was the least political song, probably. I write this next sentence as the most sincerest of compliments. He had no business writing that song at that age. Check It Out is a plaintive cry for understanding that most men can relate to. It's also, it's also insight that men twice his age couldn't write or completely fathom. It truly is a masterpiece and claims its rightful place in most playlists and video chains that I've assembled since I first heard it. Funny because uh, the radio stations uh, don't play Check It Out. They don't play it. You know, it's a good song. They don't play it. It was well documented that the 90s were a seismic change in tone, aesthetic and subject, aesthetic, aesthetic and subject matter. Mellencamp's records definitely, definitely and defiantly, oh, a little bit of alliteration there, defiantly and definitely followed that script, albeit in his own hard scrabble viewpoint. Songs like Human Wheels, Key West Intermezzo, and Get a Leg Up were different from the other songs on the radio, but still found familiar ground with artists that he had no doubt influenced, such as Tracy Chapman and Edie Brickell. Really? I don't, I don't hear that. I don't see that. It was a sort of alternative offering that was entrenched in flannel. Okay, so um, <laughs> there's so much. The timeline here is just so off, right? So Mellencamp's career started to fade when he released the song Pop Singer, right? That was kind of when he said, screw you, I don't want to be a pop singer. I'll put this out as a middle finger to you guys, and I'll, I'm going to stop writing these hit songs. And that's kind of what happened. Now, there were some great songs that Mellencamp released there toward the end, like in the early 90s, that got some airplay and rock stations. But um, Tracy Chapman was a folk singer. Edie Burkell was a quirky emo alternative folk singer. Very different from Mellencamp's kind of more middle of the road approach to music. Just, just putting it out there. I mean, this guy wants to think he's really smart about music, but yet he's not, all right? He goes, I was always compelled to listen to his 2000s releases as a result of the impact his earlier work had on me. I enjoyed them for the most part. I was also being deluged with new songs and artists and marketing plans every day as a record store owner. Oh, this guy owned a record store. I fell away from listening to many artists I grew up with, John Mellencamp included. Oh, I get it. So um, he's, he, got, he got really enlightened thanks to the music that came out in the 2000s, probably in the 90s as well. So he fell away from listening to people like Mellencamp because, you know, Mellencamp's not cool anymore. Um, he goes on, my wife buys me books every Christmas. In 2021, I unwrapped the John Mellencamp biography and reignited my infatuation with him. <laughs> Folks, <clears throat> if you get me a biography of one of my favorite artists, I'm, I'm never going to tell you I'm infatuated with them. I'm just not going to do it. I garnered even more respect for him and came to an epiphany. He's been characterized as cantankerous, impossibly one-sided in business, and a self-described little bastard. I figured out that he just has remarkably high standards. Yeah. Why not pick a great presidential candidate? Why not pick Michael Bloomberg? Those are his high standards especially for the working class folks. You know, oligarchs do really well for the working class. So yeah, I, I get what he's saying here. Rattling his saber isn't done simply because he does so without the threat of impunity. When he holds others to task, it isn't mere folly. <laughs> folly. It's not mere folly. He expects their utmost and won't entertain even an infinitesimal degree of slacking off. I generally admire that. Okay, here's, um, here's where he's wrong. The people who've worked with Mellencamp, most of them say he's a jerk. I mean, 
the drummer, I forget the guy, Kenny Aronoff, I think worked for, for Mellencamp said all these things like this guy's really difficult to work with. <laughs> it's not the high standards. He's, he's very difficult to work with. All right. <sighs> this is almost over. Thank the Lord. I plan to be at the show in Birmingham, not because I hold his songs close to my heart, although I most certainly do. What? <laughs> Why would you go to the show in Birmingham if you don't hold his songs close to your heart? Although I most certainly do. Okay, so he does. Never mind. That, that was my misreading. See, this article is so well written, and I'm following it, and I'm just getting lost in the artistry of it. I'm sorry. I'm going because I want to enjoy a night listening to an artist that elevates, inspires change, and most importantly, holds a place in the pantheon of great American songwriters. I, I, I don't see that. I don't, that a great American songwriter. He's a good songwriter. He had a string of fairly important records. I think the records he mentions from the 80s, um, he says, there aren't a lot of them left. That's true. And I feel like him playing a show this close to me means or seems like a very real invitation to touch greatness, no matter which row my seat occupies. Oh, oh no matter, no matter which seat, my, my, if I'm in the nosebleed section, it's still worth going. If I'm paying $400, well, somebody's going to send him to the show, right? So he can review it and write more of this drivel. There aren't a lot of them left, and I feel like him playing a show this close to me seems like a very real invitation to touch greatness no matter which row my seat occupies. Could we be more pompous? I mean, who? I mean, this is writing to who? People who might want to go see John Mellencamp, right? And a lot of people, by the way, who are going to see Mellencamp want him to perform the hits and they want him to shut up. Alan Hunter, you know him from MTV. I was listening to him on classic rewind for like five minutes today. And he's lecturing people. Hey, if you're going to go see Mellencamp, you should probably be quiet. Why Alan? I mean, he's talking for 20 minutes. Maybe I deserve a speaking part now that he's been telling this dumb story. Well, you don't have to agree with him. This is Alan Hunter. You don't have to agree with him to be agreeable. Here's, here's what I would come back with. Okay, but I went to this show. If I bought, hypothetically, if I bought tickets to this show, I would be wanting to hear some music eventually, right? It's kind of like me being in traffic, right? So if you're in the left lane and you're driving slow, I'm thinking this, you should not be in the left lane. And if you're performing, you shouldn't be blabbing for 20 minutes. I mean, these people are getting upset because he's telling these stories. Many of the stories are political in nature. But this guy talks about race relations. He doesn't give any examples. This Larry guy, he doesn't say, hey, this is what he's done for race relations. You know, it's one thing to talk about race relations. It might be another thing to, you know, do something significant to bring people together, which living in 2024, we are just busting people apart. You go over here and you do your thing. And the people that are going over there to do their thing, sorry to go on this tangent, they're celebrated. Like they needed space away from these other people. Um, they needed to get away from, from that. And in the old days, we used to call that segregation. So honestly, again, another 80s flashback. Things weren't like this in the 80s. Yeah, we could joke with one another. We could kid about our different characteristics without people going ape bleep, you know. But now you're not supposed to make that kind of joke. Only this person over here can make this kind, that kind of joke and get away with it. Okay, you can't say that derogatory term. But if you're in that tribe, you can say it. So what does Mellencamp actually represent? He, he represents the old guard. He represents the old way of thinking about everything. Did he write some good songs? Sure. 
I'm a fan. I actually like the music of Mellencamp more than I like the music of Springsteen. However, I will say this. Um, Springsteen as a songwriter <laughs> is slightly better than John Cougar, John Mellencamp, whatever you want to call him. Just my humble opinion. And yes, he's right. There aren't too many songwriters out there. The dinosaurs of the past aren't roaming around like they used to. So if you have an opportunity to go see him, doesn't matter which seat I'm occupying. It doesn't matter what my ticket stub says. I'm going to see Mellencamp. It's going to be enriching and enlightening. And I'll remember the days when he endorsed Michael Bloomberg for president. Yes, because Michael Bloomberg speaks on behalf of the working class. And so does Mellencamp. All right, my performance here is done. You want to go read this uh, article, check out the AnistonStar.com. Mellencamp, just a few days away, two days. So if you're in the neighborhood, you're close to Birmingham, get your tickets. They're going to sell out for sure, especially after this article, right? <laughs> um, Eric Lovery, Twilight Dream, some great music. This won't get an article in any major newspaper. So I'm going to do my little part here to uh, get it out to the masses. If you like great organic Americana music in the vein of the birds and Tom Petty, this is it right here. And for this channel, folks, after that performance, if you want to buy me a coffee, there's a way to do that. Also, uh, YouTube memberships, um, which got a lot of YouTube members out there. And Patreon. I get messages from people pretty much all day long over on Patreon, and I try to answer most of them. Um, we have conversations about people uh, like John Mellencamp over there, just because I think there are some like-minded people over there. So you can chat with them, you can chat with me, or you don't have to chat at all. You can just help the channel because the algorithm, again, after a video like this, isn't going to be my best friend. So again, thanks to everybody. God bless everyone. Um, please pray for peace in the Middle East and around the world. Pray for the end to the endless wars that never seem to end. And uh, with that, I will see you soon.